Starting a game on the right foot isn't that hard. Keep the exposition to a minimum and have some kind of hands-on opening. Get the player on your side as soon as possible. But keeping that momentum going to the end of the game, that's a little harder. The start of a game is important, but even if you screw it up, you can fix it later. Fuck up a game's ending and you're leaving your game on such a bitter note that can undo a lot of the great work that came before. But if your game is an ongoing theme that comes to a head in its final moments with a stellar final level and the conclusion of overarching plot points, there are few more satisfying experiences. It's important to note the difference between a final level and a final boss fight. Levels are denoted by having some gameplay to them that isn't simply a boss battle. The main villain might have their own final chapter, but if that's all you're doing, I can't in good faith consider that a final level. All good things must come to an end eventually, but it doesn't have to be a time to mourn. It's the time to kick ass. Converting a good idea into something that's fun to play isn't an automatic process. The thoughts that occupy your brain space might seem brilliant, but implementing them into a game in such a way that doesn't make the player want to tear their hair out takes some understanding of what makes a player angry. Large parts of Conquer's Bad Fur Day seem to slip up on this. It's a game of a great sense of humour that manifests itself in these incredibly varied scenarios, but especially towards the end of the game, things start to go awry. Near the end of Conquer's Bad Fur Day, a chapter called Spooky introduces you to how the game handles gunplay, with you shooting some zombies with a shotgun, and it's okay, but you can clearly see that the game wasn't really designed for this kind of combat. We need something a little more... stylish. The normal shooting chapters are decent, but they're just a little too clunky to not encounter problems along the way. Which is why when you start the final chapter entitled Heist, one great big Matrix parody, any problems that you might have had with the shooting is thrown straight out of the window. What we have here is a brilliant concept executed close to flawlessly. Even if the spoof flies straight over your head, you're still treated to the sight of Conker throwing himself across the room and dispatching enemies in bullet time. It might not be as challenging or as long as those previous chapters, but its brevity means that it never overstays its welcome. You just turn up, fly around a bit and get to that vault. It's just a whole heap of fun and really, Conker's Bad Fur Day needed more levels like it. And less underwater sections. If you know one thing about Half-Life apart from the obvious, it's almost certainly going to have something to do with the Gravity Gun, a weapon from Half-Life 2 that uses the physics in the game to solve puzzles and creatively kill enemies, but mostly to fuck around with objects. It's pretty creative and the game is perfectly moulded around it with plenty of opportunities to play with it. You've still got guns if there isn't anything nearby that you can launch around, but let's face it, it's not quite the same. Rock up to the final level where everything is taken away from you by the big bad guys, and everything is perfectly set up for a level to focus solely on the gravity gun. But this isn't the gravity gun that you're used to using. The one downside to the original gravity gun is that the only thing you couldn't fling around was organic material. You could throw all sorts of shit at soldiers, but you couldn't throw the soldiers themselves. Fast forward to the end of the game and the level dark energy, and you can do just that. In fact, that's all you can do. You've got to chase after the bad guy while tossing combined soldiers around the room like the ragdolls they aspire to be. It's a weird subversion on the ability loss trope seen in other games. You have every gun in the game vaporized and taken away from you, but in return you get the most ridiculously fun weapon in the game. Sounds like a fair trade to me. Half-Life 2 ends on a pretty ambiguous cliffhanger with G-Man interrupting an explosion to praise you for your achievements, but the good news is that they fixed this in the extra episodes. The bad news is that there's another one at the end of episode 2, and I bet you anything we never see it resolved. Episode 3 is only a joke for so long. Convincing the player that their quest is a worthy one isn't easy. There's only so much exposition that you can sit through without backing it up with some perspective. And hey, it's a video game! Few better ways of providing perspective than linking it with gameplay. Zelda games dabble with this occasionally. Fast forward seven years in Ocarina of Time and the threat posed by Ganondorf is about as real as it could be as you scamper away from the Reededs in the ruined castle town. Same kind of idea with Ganon's castle. He's been pretty busy in seven years. The lava butthole was a nice touch. However, Twilight Princess took a different approach where despite the invasion of dark forces in Hyrule Castle, 
things seem a little too normal. If there's one thing more jarring than seeing a drastic contrast of an area, it's there being very little difference. The atmosphere all the way through this dungeon is some of the best the series has ever crafted, building up slowly in the courtyards and gradually getting more intense the higher up the castle you go. What I really like is just how much of a normal castle this place is. There's still clearly a lot of hostility and you'll be fighting a lot of Dark Nuts before you reach Ganon and his four stage boss fight at the top, but the more you explore of Hyrule Castle, the more you realise how little has changed. And I like that. Twilight Princess is pretty good at making dungeons have a purpose other than a hole in the side of a mountain. You know, the Gorons have a mine, Gerudo Desert has a prison, and Hyrule Castle is still a castle. One that has significance all the way through your quest and doesn't disappoint when you finally get a chance to explore it properly. Need more of this, really. Whenever the hell Zelda U comes out, more of this. If a game is trying to deliver some deep sociological message or a bit of political commentary, there's the danger that you could leave the player behind. So by the time you get to the end and all of this is resolved, it seems forced. Or maybe it could all suddenly make sense. For a long time, Braid seemed like a game that was trying a little too hard to be smart. This is the kid in school who's desperately trying to answer every question and show everyone that his skull can barely contain his throbbing grey matter. Braid is a smart game from a gameplay standpoint. I can say that I haven't seen too many games that use time-based puzzles like this, and even fewer that manage to get so much variety out of such a basic mechanic. The first thing I notice is that you start at World 2 and go up from there all the way to World 7. So, where's World 1? Oh, it's the final world you visit. Yeah, this game likes itself a lot. You might look at some of these time puzzles and think that these are the main reason why you might want to play Braid, but in reality, you're here for the final level. World 1 is a little different since everything except for Tim is naturally moving in reverse, which seems a little odd at first glance but starts to make a lot of sense in the last level. Here, you're helping your love interest escape the clutches of this guy by triggering switches and getting to the right as quickly as possible. But once you reach your girlfriend, everything changes. Now the level is no longer reversed and the dynamic has changed completely. You're not saving her anymore. You were never saving her. Those switches she was pulling? Designed to stop you from reaching her. You're not the hero. This guy is. It's a simple enough twist, but having it represented by how the level plays makes this one of my all-time favourites. Oh, and if you pick up some special stars during the rest of the game, you can catch up to your girlfriend and she turns into a nuclear bomb. Maybe taking the metaphor a little too far, but eh, it'll keep you busy. Given the nature of final levels, the idea that there's not a lot of the game left after this and the story's got to sort itself out in that time, you'd expect the stakes to be quite high whatever you end up doing. A lot of the time in gaming you're told that you've only got one shot, or it's now or never, but due to the existence of checkpoints or multiple lives, it kinda loses its effectiveness. If you really want to ramp up the tension, you should make the final level have some genuine consequences about it, where you really suffer if you make the wrong move. Some sort of suicide mission. Not saying that every game should handle things like Mass Effect 2, but I think the existence of this final mission is something that other games should aspire to. You don't necessarily have to be as ruthless with failure as a suicide mission, but, you know, do something. Very few games set up a scenario where how you manage your personnel can mean the difference between victory, success at a cost, or total failure. You put someone in a role that doesn't suit them or don't upgrade your ship in the right way and important characters will start dropping like flies if you're not careful. You feel responsible yet? You could say that Mass Effect 2's final act comes with an asterisk next to it saying that you'll only enjoy it if everyone comes out of it alive, but look at it this way. It may take a lot of prior thought and planning to end up with a squad that can get through without dying, but the satisfaction when everything does come together is insane. The odds aren't stacked against you too hard, but the existence of a fail state is enough to keep you on your toes. Overcoming this and getting to the other side, few feelings like it. This is Remember Luigi, and the Mass Effect series prides itself on the permanence of your decisions, and since the suicide mission comes at the end of the second game in a trilogy, where you can pass save info onto the third game, the reward for getting everything right is huge. You've got to work for your happy ending.
Got a topic that you'd like me to discuss in a countdown? Leave a suggestion in a comment below and head over to my Twitter where I'll be holding a vote to decide the subject of the next countdown based off the best of your submissions. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed that. I'm beginning to understand that the reason why I'm covering a lot of spoilery topics nowadays is because before this, I spent five years barely touching the stuff. You've got to catch up one day. Anyway, if you like what you saw and want to support the show, I have a Patreon of all sorts of wonderful rewards going out every week. You know, i donate to me. Would be a little redundant, but it'd feel good. That's probably a masturbation joke. <laughs>